What's going on guys, it's your boy Brad and I'm back with another video. And in this video, what I wanna do is I wanna show you guys how to properly write a care plan. And then I wanna give you guys a couple of important tips and things that you need to consider whenever you are writing a care plan things to really keep in mind that are going to help you and are going to be a benefit for you. In this video, it's going to be a collaboration video with the beautiful Ashley Atkins. So make sure to head over to her channel after my video is over and check out her perspective on care plans in nursing school. Now, for those that don't know, care plans in nursing school typically consist of several parts. You have the actual care plan and these care plans come in all shapes and sizes. As you can see, you know, you've got your, uh, your nursing diagnosis statement. That's very important. I'm gonna teach you about this stuff as well. Your goals, expected outcomes. And then on the back, you've got your uh, interventions that you actually implemented while you were there. You've also got what is basically a data collection form. And these also come in all different shapes and sizes. And, you know, they're very uh, extensive. Some of them can be neurologic, you know, and they just they get broken down by body systems. And this is just something that you might use while you're actually at clinic to collect all of your information to take home with you and then to perform this nursing care plan. And then additionally, you have a medication information chart where it's got all of this information that, are, you know, they ask of you to that they want to know about your medications that your patient had and on the back labs and diagnostics and more information so it's a whole lot that goes into care plans so whenever you see nursing students talking about god i had to do a care plan all the paperwork it took hours and you don't know what it is this is going to give you a good idea so what i want to do guys is i want to take you guys over to the whiteboard and i want to show you give you an example of a typical care plan and how to actually write a nursing diagnosis statement and all of that good stuff and then we're going to come back and i'm going to give you a couple of important tips to remember and to take into consideration whenever you are doing these care plans that are going to really help you get a's all right guys so the first first part of a nursing care plan, if you remember from my little piece of paper, is the nursing diagnosis statement. Essentially what this is, is a list of statements. It's a nursing diagnosis statement, and it's hard to even explain that. You could Google it and get an idea of what that even means, but I'm gonna give you an example of one here that I actually had to do. Now, of course, I'm altering patient identifiers. I'm altering uh, information within this diagnosis statement, so none of this can be linked to anybody. So whenever you write a diagnosing statement, a nursing diagnosis statement, it's basically three parts. It is the diagnosis, it is the related to, and it's the as evidenced by. We abbreviate related to with RT, and we abbreviate as evidenced by as AEB. So let me show you what we're talking about here. So let's say our patient got shot, sustained a gunshot, and as a result, had a collapsed lung. How do we write that? Okay, well, one of the problems that we can imagine is our patient would have an ineffective breathing pattern. Now, like I said, uh, under lip and cot, that's one of the nursing diagnosis statements, ineffective breathing pattern. Ineffective breathing pattern related to and now here is where you're going to basically provide a condensed pathophysiology as far as why are they having ineffective breathing pattern? What caused the ineffective breathing pattern? Well, in this patient, it's a gunshot, right? And it's the collapsed lung. But how do we break it down to a more cellular level in order to explain patient had a gunshot and a collapsed lung? Here's how we do it. All right, guys, I know it's a lot, and hopefully you can read this chicken scratch, but basically an effective breathing pattern related to air and fluid in the pleural cavity due to a gunshot wound causing a disruption in the fluid bond between the visceral and parietal pleura because of the acute change in negative pressure in the pleural cavity resulting in atelectasis of the alveoli in the left lung. I know that's a whole lot, and there's a lot of medical words in there that some of you may not quite understand, but that is how you break it down to a cellular level. There's a disruption in the fluid bond between the visceral and parietal pleura, basically the pleura that is on the lining of the pleural cavity, and then the, the uh, parietal pleura, which is actually the lining on the lung. There's a fluid bond that keeps that, basically prevents the, it's the last ditch measure to prevent the lung from collapsing and whenever you know a gunshot wound whenever you introduce air into that cavity it disrupts that fluid bond basically causing that left lung to collapse 
or which is atelectasis of the alveoli of the left lung. It's here where we say, as evidenced by. So here we have the basic cellular breakdown, the pathophysiology. So we have ineffective breathing pattern related to all of this information. This is the cellular patho of gunshot wound causing collapsed lung. And then we're gonna say as evidenced by, what are the actual clinical manifestations that your patient exhibited letting you know, hey, they're having an ineffective breathing pattern. So it would be something like this. So again, these are the clinical manifestations, you know, data that you have collected from your patient that are evidence of ineffective breathing pattern. We had a hydropneumothorax that was revealed on a chest x-ray, basically a collection of air and fluid in the pleural cavity around that left lung. Patient was short of breath. They were gasping and wheezing for air. So that's another evidence of ineffective breathing pattern as well as the labored breathing. So that's basically a nursing diagnosis statement. There's a lot that goes into it, but it's, it's a wealth of information that you gather as you're doing this research. But that is how you properly do a nursing diagnosis statement. Remember I said it's three parts your diagnosis statement, all of the related to, and then you've got your as evidenced by, that's your third piece to it. And that is how you should properly do a nursing diagnosis statement. The next piece on the nursing care plan are your goals. Basically, it's one, it's one thing, it's one goal. And it's basically, what's your goal for the patient? Well, if you remember, our diagnosis statement was the patient has ineffective breathing pattern. Well, basically, our goal for this patient is that they're going to experience a normal breathing pattern. It's that simple. That's all you got to put for your goal. Your third piece is your expected outcomes. Here's basically where you're going to write down, uh, you know, some different expected outcomes that you plan to maintain while you're there taking care of the patient that day. So for example, uh, and I think that, you know, it varies from program to program, but I think I did three outcomes for this patient. Patients, uh, O2 sats will remain above 90% for the remainder of the shift. And one of the things that they taught us is whenever you're doing outcomes is it needs to be timed and measurable. So measurable means, you know, there needs to be something measurable attached to it, the 90%, right? And then it needs to be timed, we say, for the remainder of the shift. And then you're gonna give two additional goals. You know, the two I put, the patient will maintain regular rate, depth, and rhythm of respiration for the remainder of the shift. And then the third one was the patient's pain will be managed and kept within defined limits, within defined limits, to encourage effective respirations. So basically these are all expected outcomes that we are basing around our nursing diagnosis statement. Everything has to be based around that ineffective breathing pattern. Make sure you remember that guys. And then the very last piece to this, this care plan portion is your interventions. What did you actually do or what do you plan on doing in order to care for this patient and make sure that you meet those expected outcomes? Remember to base this around your ineffective breathing pattern diagnosis. So if an example of an intervention could be this. Administer O2 at two and a half liters per minute via nasal cannula per position order. And that's something that we actually did. And you know, it's just, and then like, for example, another one could be get your patient out of the bed and into the bedside chair. That's an intervention that you could do to try and get them up, get them mobile post-op in order to promote lung expansion. Uh, another one could be encourage the in use of incentive spirometer per physician order. It's okay if you don't know what that means, you'll learn it, but that's another example to try and promote that lung expansion, get those lungs working. A simple one, sit patient up in high phallus position. That's just to promote, uh, you know, to meet those outcomes, to maintain that oxygen saturation above 90%, things like that. That's basically a nursing care plan in a nutshell. Now let me go back over there and show you guys what we're talking about whenever we talk about these medications and these lab values and things of that nature. Important tips to remember. So now that you have a general idea of how to, you know, perform or to write a nurse care plan, let me give you a couple of tips to keep in mind. In my first semester of nursing school in fundamentals, Whenever we had to do these medication information things, it is so easy 
to copy and paste. Do not copy and paste. That is tip number one. And that's one of the most important ones. Not only does it look unprofessional because these teachers do go back and see who copy and pasted, especially when you've got multiple students turning in the exact same information if their patients share medications, so to speak, if they have the same meds prescribed to them. But also, you're really doing yourself a disservice. I was uh, set back. Whenever I went into med surge, I was kind of a step behind because I copy and pasted a lot of medication information and therefore I didn't take the time to learn it. So it's really important to actually study the medications as you're doing these medication activities. That's kind of what they're there for. And it, your instructor doesn't really care necessarily what medications your patient was prescribed. This is a tool, a learning tool for you to really get that that information ingrained in your in your mind. And the same things goes with these labs, guys. The, the lab values, the normal ranges, that's something that you need to know. It's something you need to keep in your mind, as well as these diagnostic tests. It's good if your patient had a chest X-ray ordered, it's good to begin to actually understand why they had a chest X-ray, what a chest X-ray does, what it shows, what the purpose of it is, why it's diagnostically relevant, as opposed to just copy and pasting. So don't copy and paste. As far as these data collection tools goes, um, again, they're very in-depth, a whole lot of information. This is sort of like a, uh, a template, so to speak. This is not, at least in my program, not something that we have to use. I actually make my own template, but what I was wanting to say is make sure that you collect detailed information, as much information as you possibly can on your patient. You need to dig deep into their, uh, into their medical record and really know the ins and outs because in some programs, at least in mine, there's a thing called grand rounds where basically for two hours you get up in front of your classmates and you present your patient and your teachers will drill you. They want to know, well, what was your patient's BMI? Why do they have a history of this? And why does this medication connect with that? And what does this lab value indicate? And you really need to be on top of your game. So it is important to collect very detailed information. And my final tip, the third tip is really it's very tedious work and a lot of times we can sit here and be like god this is so aggravating because it's it feels like busy work i gotta look up the medications again look up these labs again these diagnostics and it starts to become repetitive but don't look at it in a negative light don't don't look at it as half empty look at it as half full this is a learning opportunity because whenever you get out into the field and you're practicing these wonderful opportunities where you can sit back and actually do this research and you're not just you know in the moment uh practicing nursing this is a good time to actually learn and cultivate a foundation a good foundation of nursing knowledge learning lab values, what they indicate, uh, learning different medications, that's so important. Pathophysiologies, I forgot to mention, but pathophysiology is another piece, another component of these nursing care plans, and that is very important. Learning the pathos, learning the farm. I had a senior nurse at one of my clinic rotations who actually graduated from my program. She said, you learn your pathos and you learn your farm. She said, that's, that is the foundation. So look at it as a learning opportunity, guys. Don't look at it as something that's tedious that they're just making you do and it's aggravating. I know it is aggravating, but the glass is half full, ladies and gentlemen. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed the video. Go ahead and head over to her channel and check out her perspective on care plans and nursing school. As always, guys, it's Nurse Bass, soon to be. Peace.